Hi, and welcome to a new episode of the Today in Manufacturing podcast. I'm David Manti, and with me today are Jeff Ranke and Anna Wells. We each have about 15 years of experience covering the manufacturing industry. Each week, we cover the five biggest stories on our websites and discuss the implications they might have on the industry going forward. Before we get started, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, if you want to reach the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IEN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. Anna, how are you doing this week? I'm doing great. Excellent. Jeff? Even greater. Uh-uh. Good. Nope. Even greater. It's you a competition. Nope. It's March Madness. Everything is competition now. The most great. I am the most great. That was a quality opening, the guys. Mo- quality the most opening. Great. All right. Things can be better and most greater. All right. Before we jump into our top story, we have a word from our sponsor. Oil Eater's household cleaners, industrial cleaners, and industrial equipment are specifically designed to replace dangerous solvents and are used throughout the world. Our safe water-based formula dissolves grease and grime for almost any surface and leaves a fresh, non-chemical scent. Our ultra-concentrated formulas are perfect for light, medium, or heavy cleaning and can be used on shop floors, in parts washers, to clean equipment, and more. VOC compliant, Oil Eater will do an excellent job in a multitude of applications, safely and cost-effectively, while reducing your chemical usage. Safe for the user, safe for the surfaces being cleaned, and safe for the environment. For more information, visit oileater.com or call 800-528-0334. All right, and we are back. Our top story this week, and by top, I mean our first story this week, is about hackers attacking NVIDIA. A couple of weeks ago, ransomware outfit Lapsus stole more than a terabyte of data from NVIDIA, the company that redefined modern computer graphics. The hackers took NVIDIA's systems offline for two days and stole vital IP info like GPU and chip schematics and software development kits, or SDKs. They also stole the company's Falcon architecture, which is designed to help protect hardware from being hacked, and the main algorithm embedded into NVIDIA graphics <clears throat> graphics cards that are placed that place limits on cryptocurrency mining hash rates. The hackers then threatened to sell the data by bypassing this algorithm and leak everything unless NVIDIA paid up or removed the limiter. Then NVIDIA rehacked the servers and encrypted the stolen data so the hackers couldn't use it, though the hackers claimed to have encrypted unencrypted copies. Now, usernames and passwords for more than 70,000 employees have already been leaked, and the stolen code is being used to launch malware attacks on NVIDIA customers. Jeff, as the go-to cybersecurity expert in-house, what was your thought on the hackers attacking the company and then the company's hackers rehacking the hackers? Well, first of all, NVIDIA has not admitted Mm. To the rehack, okay. it was actually interesting because Lapsus actually came on and said, "Hey, nice try." Basically, yeah. they did you know sort of acknowledge that Nvidia tried to get back to them and said they were successful in getting into their servers, but they were too late. Mm. So, what's interesting is this is actually still an ongoing story. We still don't know exactly what Lapsus is going to do. And and by the way, how do we pronounce either individuals or companies who spell their name with dollar signs? I'm glad you brought that mm. up, Jeff, because I feel like David didn't even try to uh, alert the listeners that Lapsus is spelled with a dollar sign. Yeah, at the I end. believe it's pronounced Lapsus stupid. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Take careful. That. Yeah, careful. Yeah, um, I don't mean that. I don't mean that. Please don't take my stuff. No. <laughs> um, it, this is a this group though. You may be hearing more from these guys. They're believed to be out of South America, specifically Brazil. Um, they've had a couple of very high profile hacks. This being one of them. I think you're going to talk a little bit about another one in a little bit. But these guys are a little bit different too in the fact that even though they're a multinational. They are come out and said they are do not care about politics. Mm-hmm. There is nothing more to them. They are all about the money. That's yeah. all they really want. And I think in this oh. instance, <laughs> hence the dollar well, sign. Well, that makes sense yeah. now, Jeff. You got to yeah. say Laps it. Is dollar sign. Had you said we're it, we're all about the money. Makes sense. There you go. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think we're going to be hearing more of these guys. Uh, they're very straightforward in that. And I also think when they got this terabyte of data, I think they were just probing to see what they could get. I yeah. think they were shocked. And yep. everything that they did uncover here, because this is a bunch of big stuff. Obviously, the Falcon architecture that's ironically enough put in place to help prevent devices that use the NVIDIA cards from being hacked. 
mm-hmm. is basically what they uncovered, as well as, like you said, the limiter that is most prominently kind of known for limiting those hash rates for crypto mining. It's also a big deal on other devices because it basically slows things down to a point where power consumption doesn't get out of control and the other internal working components also don't get overworked. Okay. So it's not just for crypto. It could also be something that could actually help like gaming systems move faster, yeah. but not so fast that the device wears out too soon. That was my biggest question about this story is, is the limiter bad, you know, and <clears throat> is it necessary? And you're saying that it actually is protecting these devices from overworking and kind of frying out prematurely? Yeah, that's that's essentially why it's in place. According to NVIDIA, mm-hmm. the hackers, they're trying to say, no, you're just holding us back. Yeah. What's the real, and it probably varies by device and by application, to be honest. Is this the same as a governor on a car? Similar, but you know, with a governor, you're focusing on one area of operations. Yeah. You're looking at the engine. This is sort of more all-encompassing. Okay. Because when you look at a graphics card, I mean, the initial thing we think about is like gaming systems and mm-hmm. all of the graphics yeah. that, that come in piece. But it's also used a lot in different mobile devices. It, it just ties into a lot of technology that we use every single day. So again, it's it'll be interesting. This is still ongoing. We don't know exactly what they're going to do with all of the things they hacked. I don't think Lapsus knows. At the end of the day, they just want to get paid. Mm-hmm. But they're going to milk this because, number one, it's a high-level customer or company that really hasn't come out and spoken a lot about it publicly other than to acknowledge that it happened. And also, um, the more the more evil they can almost be about this, it stands to build their reputation up. So the next time somebody they hack somebody, they just know... Don't mess with these guys. Yeah. Just pay them. Don't even think. And they could go away. Yeah. Um, Anna, so Lapsus, uh, Lapsus dollar sign, my apologies, has also hit Samsung and the video game company Ubisoft. Uh, What do you think? I mean, how do you prepare as a company for something like this? Or is it just do your best and hope that you have the most safeguards in place? Yeah, I don't know exactly what people take from this when they see something like this. I mean, on the one hand, it's pretty cool that like NVIDIA, if this is true, is not going to go down without a fight. Mm -hmm. That's better than a lot of people are doing. But do people see this and think like we really need to get our arms around cybersecurity or do they see this and think if you're targeted, you're targeted and there's almost nothing you can do about it. And this big tech company who has probably a very sophisticated system in place can't even fend off these hackers, then what are we going to do? You know, because like, I think, I think maybe the latter, because, you know, the data on cybersecurity is there. Jeff, you cover this a lot, as David mentioned, Um, you know, the directives as time goes on, get more and more intense about what's coming. And if you don't implement a plan yet, businesses really (laughs) like they kind of continue to acknowledge that they're not doing enough. They know they're not doing Mm -hmm. enough. They need to do better, but they're persisting and still not doing enough. Mm -hmm. Um, Like in 2018, Inc. Magazine reported that up to 60% of small businesses that get hit with a a cyber attack uh, shutter within um, six months. Whoa. That's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And yet in in, in August, as recently as August, there was another report put out by CNBC and Momentiv that said that 56% of small businesses said they're not concerned about being the victim of a hack in the near future, while 42% of them say that if they did... They have no plan in place for a response. Yeah. yeah. So what are we doing? And I, I don't know. I, I just wonder when you see a high profile story like this, does it help people to like try harder or does it make people kind of throw up their hands and say like, if they can't do it, how can we do it? That's, you know? I'm on that. I'm on that side where it's just like, all right, you have 70,000 strong at NVIDIA. I mean, other than a handful of other companies that I would think I would expect to be more protected than NVIDIA. I mean, if NVIDIA can't keep well, them at bay. I think there was a little bit of hubris here. We talk about this a lot with some of these bigger companies. I'm sure NVIDIA is like, try it. Like yeah. we, are, we are who we are. We, they're developing different architecture just to prevent stuff from being hacked for their customers. So they probably, there was a sense of we're too big to get in here. Who's going to come after us? And I think the vulnerability was obviously way beyond what they could imagine. Kind of what you were just talking about, Anna. When we talk to the experts on the security breach program, the big thing they say is it's, you have to have a mentality of it's not if, it's when. Mm-hmm. And you have to have a plan in place. Now, maybe NVIDIA's plan was, hey, we're going to strike back. We're going to try to hack back and get that data. That's part of our plan. Well, it didn't really work too well because these folks were smart enough to just copy it right away yeah. and keep everything. Even though what NVIDIA got to was encrypted and unusable, they already had it. 
Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. Just have a plan. Kind of like we were talking about last week and with the uh, the asteroid shotgun. Yeah. Even if it's not always the most feasible sounding, have something in place. Mm-hmm. Develop yeah. a strategy so that you can be ready to respond to these things. The other thing, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later as well, is this underscores how, as a community, especially the industrial sector, needs to talk to each other about this stuff when it happens. Oh, yeah. Nobody wants to admit that it took place. Nobody wants to admit that they were hacked and that they were they were vulnerable. But the more you, they do talk about this stuff and share what happened, the more likely we are to become more secure in everything. Mm-hmm. And with a company like NVIDIA, it's not just their intellectual property. It's how it relates to everything that goes into the devices using those GPUs. Mm-hmm. Our, our cell phones, mm-hmm. our, our computers, our gaming systems, all of those things that also become vulnerable if companies remain this sort of arrogant about their approach to cybersecurity. And when we've talked to manufacturers or people uh, in the industry, of all the different aspects of the business that they seem willing to collaborate on, cybersecurity seems to be like one of them. Well, it's the finger pointing. Like, yeah. everybody, it's, no, it's, well, you embed the stuff. That's on you. Well, no, you manufacture it. That's on you. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm talking about like manufacturer to manufacturer. What are you, where, how are you protected yeah. and how can I use that, that to too. protect yeah, my company? Right. All right. Our next most popular story this week, large cargo ship sinks in rough weather. On Thursday, a cargo ship longer than a soccer field sank during a storm in the Persian Gulf. The vessel, the Al Salmi 6, had 30 crew members. Emergency personnel from Iran and civilian ships saved 29 crew members. One is believed to be drowned. The choppy waters forced the vessel to list or lean at a precarious angle, and it was fully submerged within hours. The ship's owners, Dubai-based Salam Al Makrani Cargo Company, specializes in car freighters. The Al Salmi 6 is nearly 24 yards wide, 151 yards long, and it's called a roll-on, roll-off carrier because automobiles can drive on and off of it very easily. Jeff, it sounds like another cargo ship with uh, vehicles on it had a really bad week. And you just kind of wonder, we know about all the struggles in the automotive supply chain, latest figures, there's there's like a two and a half million vehicle um, gap in terms of what's being produced and what what people want out there around the world. So, if these if this ship was indeed carrying a bunch of cars, it's kind of been cloudy there. They haven't talked a lot about what yeah. actually went down. It's mm-hmm. believed to be a lot of automobiles, but you can see why when that if that captain is looking at dollar signs, getting to shore, mm-hmm. getting as many of those vehicles offloaded as quickly as possible to take advantage of some of this demand that's being pent that was pent up here for so long. Maybe took some risks in some mm-hmm. weather. That he shouldn't have. Uh, it seems like he put a lot of a lot at risk. Maybe you know we don't know. Maybe it was some sort of rogue wave or something that that took the ship. But if you see any of the video, the New York Post actually had some video yeah. of this ship. Man, that looks like some scary a scary environment to be in, and then even more just frightening as to how that ship was leaning and, and what it was well, dealing with for the rescue situation as well. Because at first, uh, Anna, did you watch the video? Like at first, it looks very still. And then, like, as you kind of watch it, you see the massive rolling waves. Because, you know, I, I want to see, like, I'm thinking of seeing, like, large waves crashing right. over this thing. Mm-hmm. And then you're just like, oh, no, it looks perfectly still. Oh, no, it's yeah. it's really rough, rough yeah. up there. And it happens so fast, which mm-hmm. is really terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, more severe weather, more catastrophic consequences that we're seeing. Um, obviously, scientists uh, are expecting more of this type of of weather, extreme weather. Um, and that was pinned as like one of the reasons that this happened. Mm -hmm. Typically the weather does not, it's not like that in this strait of Hormuz, was it? Um, and I don't know, I think like, so I, I found an article that Forbes ran in June where, uh, contributor Rennie Van de Weg, sorry. Nailed it. (laughs) For sure. Nailed it. (laughs) Uh, so he was talking about how businesses should be using, like advanced weather modeling and forecasting technology to help make better logistical decisions in terms of like how to account for incoming bad weather. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that's great advice, but there are very few people that are in charge of making those decisions as to like when to dock and when to speed up and slow down and reroute. Like most of the people that are impacted by these types of maritime incidents are the people who like now don't have cars to sell Mm -hmm. or had a few pallets on a ship that 
they had earmarked for a certain customer that now they have to go back to that person, maybe lose that order. Right. Yeah. For them, I feel like as this stuff continues to happen and tack on that insurance companies kind of growing wise to climate change and looking at the long term and probably starting to build some more fat into what they need to get out of their customers to account for the fact. I mean, how many ships are you going to pay for at the bottom of the ocean if you're an insurance company, right? Right, yeah, right. Before you start making them take a few extra precautions. Right. Or like pay a lot more money, you mm-hmm. know, and who who that's all going to trickle down. So I guess what I'm getting at is I wonder, we heard a lot more about onshoring during the pandemic and that trend sort of getting a boost because people were concerned about some of these supply chains and medical products and all that stuff. Right. But I feel like this is another maybe big factor that could be influencing people here. Obviously with auto, like that's, you know, it's not a commodity market. It's harder to just say, (laughs) buy your cars here. I mean, you know, that's just how it is. But for a lot of products, um, as the challenges mount, that come along with buying them from overseas. And this continues to be one of them. Um, maybe we will see some more onshoring of supply from, you know, as a re- result of this. I don't know. Well, and, and maybe not just, we always think about it locally here in the U S mm-hmm. but these were, I think they were headed somewhere in the middle East, probably, you know, the closest docking point was Iran. It's actual end destination. I don't think was actually referenced or, or where it was it intending wasn't, and, no. and going, but yeah, not just here, but everywhere. I mean, you yeah. could see more of a localization impact globally in terms of how people want to do that. It'd be interesting to see how that impacts production efficiencies and, and other things too. But to your point, <laughs> it has to get there before you can make any money off of it. And we're having this many issues because we're either going too fast, not considering all of the different safety factors involved. I mean, we've been hearing about boats catching on fire, mm-hmm. <laughs> boats mm-hmm. sinking, cotton weather, all of these different factors that in the past, either they weren't being recognized because supply chain wasn't as much of a prominent global issue or because they weren't happening. Right. So, Well, and today, right before, uh, or maybe it was last night, um, an earthquake hit Japan and may have shut down uh, or created a whole new problem with uh, chips in the auto mm-hmm. industry too. So yep. we have, uh, you know, completed cargo or completed vehicles that are, sinking once again and uh the chip shortage that only seems like it's getting worse because of extreme weather events Mm -hmm. um i also wanted to take a minute to uh shout out the civilians like so 11 crewmen were rescued by civilians who got in boats and pulled them out of the water wow that's insane that was just that just sounds like the coolest thing ever to me when they talked about a total like the total numbers i was a little confused i think there's only one that ended up still yeah. Missing? No, he was officially like, or uh, the person was officially declared drowned. Okay. Um, because no, the uh, uh, initial port report was really, it was based off the one captain's quote. And he's like, yeah, we had 16 that were rescued, 11 that were picked up by civilians, and then like a tanker pulled one out. And he had that really weird quote where he said like two were still bobbing in the sea. Yeah. It was yeah. just like, but you know they are? Yeah. Well, like- we're, we're still looking at a crew for this entire <laughs> ship that's under 50 people, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Doesn't that seem kind of crazy for something that big? Well, yeah, because that's another part of the, like, not understanding the scale of those waves. Like, I mean, it is like, I, you think of a soccer field, which again is like, can be many different shapes and sizes, but it's huge. Yeah. And so I wondered if like, sometimes if you're operating on a vessel that large, if you have, I don't want to say hubris, but you almost think like nothing's going to sink this ship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, just because, uh, Jeff, kind of to your point, we talked about the Ever Given, which got stuck in the Suez Canal uh, about last year. That just ran aground again in the Chesapeake Bay. It did? Yeah. I did not see that. Yeah, it ran aground. And then luckily, uh, it turned out that uh, the hull was not damaged. But not a good not a good week for the Ever Given again. Uh, we talked about the Felicity Ace, which sank earlier this month. Mm-hmm. I mean, depending on which resource you look at, bad weather and or natural disasters are the number one cause of these maritime accidents. And Anna, to your point, I think they just, we got to start getting smarter about the routes that we're taking. Um, we taught, we, we hope that autonomous ships will hopefully help prevent casualties in the future, but we're going to need to do more to stop these type of accidents from happening on the water. Mm-hmm. All right. <clears throat> Our next most popular story this week, Tesla employee fired for YouTube tech reviews. John Bernal is a former Tesla employee working on the autopilot program. Bernal was fired last month because of video reviews he conducted on his YouTube channel, AI Addict. In the reviews, 
Bernal drives his own 2021 Tesla Model 3 using the company's new full self-driving beta software. It looks like Bernal was fired after posting a video in which his his own Model 3 knocks over a bollard or post while in full self-driving mode. His managers said he was uh, his managers say he, quote, broke Tesla policy and his channel was a, quote, conflict of interest. And I mean, yeah. (laughs) Now, in his videos, he shows numerous flaws with the beta version of full self-driving, including one time when he almost crashed into a vehicle crossing in front of him. Bernal says he never unveiled anything the public didn't already have access to, but Tesla's social media policy says it, quote, relies on the common sense and good judgment of its employees to engage in responsible social media activity. Now, Anna, when you heard that part of the social media policy, did you think about any other Tesla employees? (laughs) Good judgment using social media. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's also extremely vague wording, but whatever, that they don't need to be specific, honestly, like... Um, I guess I have mixed feelings about this incident. Like you kind of want to feel bad for the guy on the one hand because he got fired. Mm -hmm. However, like, is he trying to be a whistleblower of sorts or is he really just an employee just casually publishing information that makes Tesla look bad? Because that's what it seems like to me. And um, whether or not full self-driving sucks, which we think it probably might, um, but we have a lot of evidence to back that up. Mm -hmm. Um, Unfortunately for Mr. Bernal... If Tesla does have this policy about public comments, um, then they absolutely can fire him for violating that. And he wouldn't be the first or last, you know, like you're legally protected if you post something about like safety, uh, sexual harassment, stuff like that. Um, But beyond that, like as an at will employee, they can fire you for pretty much anything. And I think like the gray area here could have been what a court might consider a matter of public concern. Mm hmm. But in this case, he already admitted that he never disclosed anything that wasn't already publicly available. Um, I don't think he can even he could even pursue that route legally. So I don't know. I think that it's sort of naive. It would be naive to think that you could just sort of casually post this stuff and, um, it, you know, it was being viewed widely. It was syndicated on like a national network, mm-hmm. which I, I realized maybe was not his intent. But you have to expect that that's a possibility. Um I don't know if if it's his employer and it makes the tech look incapable, I can see why they don't like it. Yeah, it's uh, after watching some of his videos, I'll say that I definitely got the uh, vibe that he was trying to be more of a reviewer of the technology rather than a whistleblower. But maybe if he would have tried that, he would have protected himself a little bit more. Exactly. And it, that's not the route that he took. Um, but again, I don't think that was his intention Yeah. To, to try to like blow the lid off anything. I think he was being casual. Like this was something fun for him. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I don't know. Tesla didn't like it. Elon don't like it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jeff, do you think that it's good common sense on social media to challenge the leader of a country currently in a war to a fight? That's what where where did that come from? That, uh, uh, the segue. No, sorry. Uh, Elon Musk is currently trying to uh, challenge Vladimir Putin to uh, MMA style fight. Yeah, I would not challenge Vladimir Putin to an MMA style fight, especially not if you're Elon Musk. Yeah, I would not do that. Um, getting back to what we were actually talking about, <laughs> can, I, can I make an Social, awkward segue back? No, 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 no. Social media policy and responsibility. Uh, yeah, no. Uh, no, let's that is not back. a good idea to challenge a Russian dictator <laughs> to a hand-to-hand combat. No, uh, I actually, your previous segue was better. Um, <laughs> did you get a chance to watch any of um, AI Addict's videos? I did. And when I first started watching, when I first saw the story, I was completely thinking, you know what? This is kind of the type of thing you keep in the family. Mm-hmm. Why would you broadcast this? But I watched the videos, and I think Tesla totally screwed up this situation. Yeah. Um, After watching him, I thought this guy did a huge service for autopilot and Tesla because when he's going through it, there was many more times when he said, wow, that actually worked pretty well. Hey, did you see how it handled that change of lanes? Hey, there were people there. They were moving really slowly, but autopilot still picked it up and handled it the correct way. Mm -hmm. Now, there were, in the course of the two videos that I watched, the two most frequently ones, the two most recent ones, combined, I think they were about 25 minutes, Mm -hmm. and there was maybe two or three incidents where autopilot screwed up. Yeah. And the big one is when they hit that, whatever it was, the, not the hit pylon, the post, the yeah. post, yeah. The bollard. 
Right. And I mean, and he was like, whoa, that's kind of crazy. And he got out and showed it, but it wasn't like it ran it over and caused a bunch of damage. It was basically it scratched the paint. Mm-hmm. So I think. What if it was a dog? Well, it, the dog would have been moving. I think it was part of the problem. The dog would have been moving. Mm. So it wouldn't have been as much of an issue. But it, I think it did a lot of good in really showing the potential of this technology and also showing the limitations of it so that if people are watching this and if they are for some weird reason buying a Tesla solely for the autopilot functionality, this helps them to see it's great, Mm -hmm. but it's not there yet. They're still working through the bugs. That runs counter to Elon Musk's position on this, which is like 100% we are ready to go by the end of the year. And that's where, yeah. That's where the problem lies, I think, is that it, it, you know, he, Mm -hmm. he would, uh, he positions this technology like it's ready to roll. And then there's somebody who's like basically speaking, maybe people view speaking on behalf of Tesla as well, showing all the problems that are there. He's yeah. speaking on behalf of common sense, because if you have common sense, you realize that this is not ready for prime time yet. I understand where Musk is coming from, but this is where he screwed up because mm-hmm. they should have gotten behind this guy and said, this is one of our own. Yeah. He is putting his life as well as that of his cohort. Cause there's another guy that's talking about it as well. And they're going through the paces of a regular inner city route. They mm-hmm. take it up on the freeway, I think once or twice. They're all around San Jose. He, even in the last video, starts it by saying, I just got fired for doing this, mm-hmm. yeah. but I'm going to do it anyway because I feel it's important for you guys to see this stuff. Yeah. This is this is close to him. This isn't something he's just like, eh, whatever. I kind of work there. I put stuff together. Yeah. This is what he does. Yeah, this he is his project. Yeah. So I think for him to sort of take this almost counter hubris approach yeah. to this technology is something Tesla should have embraced. And they should have been thankful for this guy for presenting a real world understanding of this technology yeah and instead they fired him which was stupid no i was surprised that he wasn't applauded as some sort of like guerrilla marketing move you know uh even if they didn't know about it you like, are surprised well no like Elon maybe embrace Musk. it okay well no no i'm not surprised but like i mean actually i wouldn't be surprised if all of this was some sort of marketing move where they're just like no fire him we'll get even more press he's for secretly it. an actor and he has an imdb we should find it <laughs> Um, no, he's secretly just still working for the company. Um, no, it was fast and furious nine. Oh, aren't they on like 14? I don't know. Um, F nine. No, with the most recent video, uh, I found it also fascinating that, so it was what, two days later, he found a new Tesla from a friend with FSD beta and then posted a new video. Um, just, yeah, two days ago. And in the video, I really like that he posted the, a message to Tesla saying, like, please re-enable my beta. Mm-hmm. And I thought, uh, Jeff, to your point, what he was doing was a lot of, like, live product testing. And he was doing a great job explaining it. Yeah. Because, like, you know, like, my my takeaway from it was it was really herky-jerky. And um, it showed me a full 30-minute experience of autopilot that I was like, oh, yeah, this is really not there. But he did a really good job of, like, like all of a sudden the car would break and it's just like, I don't know why it would break. And then he would like push a button that, you know, you send an alert on the beta. Yeah. So that mm-hmm. way they know to like, look at all the cameras and everything. And he did a good job of describing, like, I think it's maybe because of that worker. I don't understand we're in construction. Maybe it's because of this person, uh, as to why, uh, the car made certain choices. He had to run a red light as a result of a car making, yeah. uh, a stop on a railroad tracks. And so, I, I just thought it was a really interesting tutorial of the um, the tech, but Anna, to your point, it completely runs in the opposite direction of what Musk is saying is already capable. Well, and I, you know, I th- I also think it's cool, but you know, we as journalists, like, we get a press release that, and then it's reissued five minutes later because they want to change one word or. Mm trim a quote or something like companies are so protective of their brands and their technologies, like to not have control over what is essentially a marketing arm that is, has Tesla's name on it. This guy Mm -hmm. works for Tesla. I can see why they were uncomfortable with that. And I, I I get your point. I just, I'm not, I guess, surprised that they fired him, honestly. Well, in a little bit to that point, uh, Nolan, who worked on this article and this video, he asked as he was writing it up, does this only happen at Tesla? And I just said, no, it happens everywhere. Mm -hmm. But when it happens at Tesla, it makes news because they don't have people that get in front of it or get around it. Like Tesla, it just sort of happens because there's no marketing arm. There's no PR. It's just like you're fired. It's in the news. We're going to work with it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, you know, when this happens at Ford and GM, they have things in place to kind of like, I don't know, keep a control the situation. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. <clears throat> Our next most popular story this week. Smart devices spy on you. What was interesting about this article, right? Shocker. What was interesting about this article is that it was written by a pair of computer scientists who study data management and privacy. They say privacy is in more danger than ever. In, tw <laughs> in 2018, there were 22 billion in there were 22 billion internet connected devices in use around the world. By 2030, there will be more than 50 billion. Manufacturers promise that only automated decision-making systems see your data, not humans. But that's not always true. For example, Amazon workers listen to Alexa conversations if the AI can't figure it out. Few consumer internet-connected devices are very, are very secure at all. And consumers need to better understand the trade-offs between privacy and comfort when buying these devices. Regulations are an important step, but enforcement struggles to keep pace. Now, the author says that you need to protect yourself. Two key steps are updating the device's firmware regularly and going through its settings and disabling any data collection that you don't want. If you're on the fence about purchasing an internet-connected device, they say, find out what data it captures. And finally, ask yourself, are you, what are you willing to sacrifice for smart? So Anna, what are you willing to sacrifice for smart? <laughs> Okay, so I do think that there's a little bit of cost-benefit analysis that has to occur here. Mm -hmm. Like, if my car were tracking my whereabouts, so if I, like, went off the road in a remote area, someone could find me, mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I would, like, enable that. But for a lot of this, I think the problem is it's, like, information mining just for the company's benefit. There's no discernible payback for the end user. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this stuff has been reported like on and off over the years and people either choose to take it seriously or to brush it off. And unfortunately, yeah. the more we look the other way in the name of Alexa or Siri or whatever, the more slippery that slope sort of becomes and our privacy is being compromised. Right. But it's my opinion, honestly, that like the long consent forms that are like in dense legalese, you have to scroll down, scroll down, are like like the biggest part of this problem because... People accept those terms because they a, don't have time to read that or mm -hmm. B, they don't have a law degree mm -hmm. uh, needed to understand like the nuances of what they're agreeing to. And I think people just take this like track of like, well, what's the worst that could happen? Um, and honestly, the results of that aren't clear on a personal level. You right. know, like a lot of this is like data that's being compiled and aggregate. You don't necessarily feel how that's impacting you. Um, and I think that makes it easier for individuals to kind of ignore those consent forms and just click, I agree and oh, yeah, move they, on and not think about what's it again. The joke you know? Everybody says, right. Time to sign away my life. And it's just like, but you really are. Yeah. I mean, no, who's reading that? Mm -hmm. but I it, mean, nobody, the, uh, honestly, when I thought of this, the company that is doing the best is, I think you guys have both have iPhones, but with, uh, a Google device, Whenever you run an update, it gives you a very simple bulleted list of like, we're improving this, this, and this. And it's just like, thank you. Do that for me. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, to your points, like, uh, I, uh, do you ever read the terms of use? No. Yeah. I don't even do What's it. What's the like, worst that could happen? <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Especially with, I mean, uh, uh, on a personal level, there are more and more smart uh, children's toys. It's like, why oh. do I need to sign on for terms of use? For a little device that grabs a ball, sings, and throws it. Oh, my God. Set up a profile for your three-year-old. Like, oh. no, I'm not doing that. What? Exactly. Um, Jeff, what were your thoughts on, I mean, if you have a smart device, part of me says that all of our information is already out there. So what does it matter if I'm enabling my uh, <laughs> fridge? But there's, I think there's a lot to this in terms of, you know, we got to a point where we're so used to giving away our information for free that maybe we're not realizing how much of what people know about us is out there. Well, a couple of things. First of all, when they talk about in 2018, 22 billion internet connected devices, 20, 30, 50 billion, all of those numbers have to be off by at least 100%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, it's going to be always, way, higher, way higher. There's way more stuff connected to the internet than we can count or track or whatever you want to say. It's just part of life. Um, I think we've entered this age where it's more about becoming comfortable with how vulnerable you want to be. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think about it at home, when I watch TV, especially like this month with all the basketball on, I watch it on YouTube TV, which is a Google company, mm -hmm. via an Amazon Fire Stick. 
Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I've got two companies right there that basically run the world and all the data in it that if somebody hacks into that, I mean, they've got a lot of personal information that they can get, credit card information, whatever, if they want to. I think what we think in that instance, or at least I try to, is there are some things in place, whether it be at the bank or on a life lock type level, where at least you'll know what's going on at some point. Yeah. I think what's scary when we get into more of these consumer devices like the fridge and lighting and the thermostat, the thermostat is, yeah. man, like... <laughs> That has to be a lot easier to potentially get into if you're somebody who wants to either hack information, try to get more personal data, whatever it is. If you're a bad actor out there, those things scare me more because it just it seems like it'd be so much easier potentially to get in there. There doesn't seem to be the inherent or organic security precautions that we think at least yeah. are in those other things that we're that we're talking about. That's why some of these scare me more mm-hmm. because the type of data they're collecting isn't really what bothers me. It's more about where it can lead. Like the vulnerability of it? Yeah. yeah. Are you scared of the dark and you just don't want someone to turn off your lights? <laughs> no, he doesn't I'm want more, people to know that the I don't lights want are anybody, on all night. Yeah, I don't want anybody to, to control that mm-hmm. um, and know that. And that's what scares me. And I think, you know, we were talking about this a little bit before. And we've talked, whether it's on a manufacturing or a product development level, on who is responsible for the embedded security. If we're looking at the the wireless router we all have in our homes, if we're talking about our smartphones, if it's those those smart thermostats, all of that, when you talk to people at the component level, they're saying, look, our components are set to work with a bunch of other stuff to do this. The manufacturers say, we source all these components to make this work. So the component people think it's on the manufacturers. The manufacturers mm-hmm. think it's on the component people to get more of this embedded security in place. And then both of those will team up and say, David, that's on you. Mm-hmm. You have to make sure it's safe. Yeah. What I think is kind of funny, too, is I think it was the FTC that was linked to um, in the uh, in the article or the yeah the Federal Trade Commission. And the things that they talk about, they're about changing a username and password, um, two-factor authentications updating the device or disconnecting it when it's not in use. Mm -hmm. Those are all really good ideas. Yeah. How many times have you used that double factor identification stuff where you have to log in and then you make the device or whatever, send you something on your phone to do it again. Mm -hmm. You do it like one time and you're like, that's a real pain. Mm -hmm. Uh, This double factor authentication stuff is ridiculous. Yeah. You shut it off. Well, uh, the other device that um, is vulnerable that also kind of bugs me a little bit is the Roomba. Because a Roomba, if it's web enabled, has a perfect uh, layout of your home um, that it uses to, you know, map your house when Mm -hmm. it's going to clean it. And it's just, I mean, okay, maybe not for me. Am I worried about people breaking in and stealing two rooms full of toys? Mm -hmm. But like for other people, that could be a real security risk. Yeah. Um, Finally, talking about some of the regulation, the one thing, one of the regulations that I like is the uh, the data subject access request or DSAR, which requires organizations collecting data on you to respond within a month and explain what is collected, how it's used within the organization and whether it is shared with any third parties. And that's also something that I love in theory, but in practice, I just don't see like making these requests. Right. You know, it's a. Right. I mean, part of me wants to reach out, like, first of all, take an inventory of everything that's connected in the house and then just fire some of these out and see what they have. But I, the one I know I don't want to uh, get back is from Amazon because Alexa, I've seen our Alexa device or the Echo get smarter as uh, Des, my one of my kids has been talking to it. And at first, you know, Alexa didn't know when he said, Alexa, play pause patrol. Had no idea. But now he's just like, Alexa, pause patrol. And she's just like playing Paw Patrol <laughs> and just plays the entire catalog. And I'm just, he didn't get better at saying it. She yeah. just had a better understanding. And that was probably that file being sent to a person who said, no, he's saying Paw Patrol, re inputting that back into the device yeah. for it to learn. Yeah, it's never where this stuff starts. It's yeah. where it goes from there. And like where they talk about, it's just, you know, the machine learning. It's There's no human being connected there. Maybe not at first, but we know that's not the case down the line. All right. Our top story this week is Russia's war in Ukraine and the impact sanctions will have on manufacturing. It's kind of a two-parter. The first story is about activists storming an aluminum tycoon's mansion. A group of activists in London recently stormed a mansion owned by Oleg Deripaska, the billionaire president of Rusal, a Russian, or Rusal, a Russian aluminum company 
considered the second largest producer of aluminum in the world. The oligarch is apparently Russian, uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin's favorite industrialist, and he's been sanctioned by the UK. Last week, Deripaska said peace in Ukraine is needed, quote, as soon as possible. Well, despite the sentiment, activists said they, quote, liberated his property. The second popular story was Western sanctions crush a Russian automaker. This is a story uh, first reported in the Wall Street Journal that says Russian car maker Lada shut down its factories and placed thousands of workers on leave last week following economic sanctions imposed by Western nations. Lada's parent company is now owned by French automaker Renault, and it relies on vehicle subassemblies and components made by a Renault factory in Romania. More than 20% of its other parts are made outside of Russia. Lada has other problems stemming from Russia's banishment from a global payment system. The crisis could mean a shortage of cars in Russia with no clear way out. One former executive said that without support from Renault, it could take years to resume production at Lada. Officially, Anna, the company says it idled its plants through early March due to a worldwide shortage of semiconductors. That's, mm. according to the company, that's their only problem. Yeah, that seems like the only thing going on over there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I'm going to let Jeff cover Lada. I want to talk first about uh, this tycoon and his mansion, <laughs> Oleg Deripaska. So Forbes says that his um, net worth, and this is real time, like they update this, um, is still $2.3 billion despite all the stuff going on there. Jeez. So he's doing fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so after this initial protest in London, um, eight people were actually arrested and the police essentially shut down this whole squatting thing, which is fine because I think that they got their point across in a very public way. Um, they said their goal was to take over this mansion to provide space for refugees. Mm-hmm. But the reality of that was naive. I don't know if that was really their true <laughs> Goal, um, but you know, I think that said, the the more visibility that you give to these Russian oligarchs, the more they're called out by name, the more their pictures and business dealings are shown across the internet. I think really the more pressure there is to target them specifically for sanctions. And we covered this because he is the executive, as you said, of this massive processing firm. Um, but the interest in this story, I think, is how much these Russian billionaires actually made as the country privatized after Mm -hmm. uh, the fall of communism and really um, took a lot at that time. And so, I mean, there was a lot of favoritism there. In fact, this guy, Oleg uh, Deripaska, used to be married to Boris Yeltsin's daughter. Oh. So Mm -hmm. I don't know if that factored in at all. Yeah, until like his appointment. In Yeah, how much money he made. Mm -hmm. Um, But, uh, you know, if you find yourself for a second feeling bad for this guy, the U.S. sanctioned him before, actually, in 2018. And at the time, the Treasury Department said that he had been accused of threatening the lives of business rivals, Mm. um, illegally wiretapping a government official and taking part in extortion and racketeering schemes. So not just like a regular dude running a company and accidentally gets embroiled in this political nightmare. Yeah. This guy played his own role and... Um, really kind of gained a lot on the backs of the regular um, citizens of Russia. So so no tears for Oleg. I'm not feeling it, no. Okay. No. Um, Jeff, I guess uh, I'll follow up with my same question I asked Anna that she dodged very elegantly. Um, it's more than a chip problem that's going to cause Lada any problems. Yeah, Lada is actually a really interesting company. If you look into them, they are from, I don't know what the equivalent would be, maybe the Ford F-150 or the Corvette or the Camaro or something like that. This company represents everything automotive essentially about Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay, And while the Renault Group does own the parent company that owns this, you know, you remember Rostec? Remember talking about them a little bit? Yeah. They actually own a piece of this company as well. Really? Okay. And as it would happen... Another one of Putin's buddies actually owns or is the president of CEO of Rostec and is also involved, obviously, with a lot of them. That's so crazy. His name is Sergei Chemizov. Chemizov? He is the guy who owns the $600 million yacht that they've been talking about and trying oh. to, um, to seize. So when you look at these oligarchs, they are 
They're bad people, okay? And they, like Anna said, they have made their fortunes on the backs of the Russian people. What's interesting with Lada being shut down is you're looking at tens of thousands of workers. Mm -hmm. You're also looking at a staple of their automotive culture. Now, automotive in the U.S. means different than what it does in other places, but this is a national symbol of pride within the country. So to see that shut down, and then they have to start asking questions, well, the state response is semiconductor chips. Yeah. But... As we've heard, there's a lot of propaganda going on over there in terms of the Russian media not really talking about what's going on in Ukraine. Maybe these things, as more of them happen, people have to have their eyes opened a little bit, and it makes them ask more questions and puts more pressure on these oligarchs as well as Putin. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that it would impact such a big company and one that is so prominent within Russia. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reading a book right now. I highly recommend it. It's called Red, no Red Notice mm -hmm. by Bill Brucker. Um, he, it's about, and he talks about it. I got to a part in the book where he is dealing now with one of these oligarchs. And it, the book takes place right after the fall of the Soviet Union, when there was a lot of privatization going on. And he's starting to deal with one of these guys over a, uh, a business deal. And essentially, as soon as his investors heard who he was dealing with, they sent, they sent basically a small army of bodyguards to protect him as he was moving yeah, around yeah. Moscow. So these guys are no joke. They come out and say the things like was said there, what Oleg said about we need peace in Ukraine, but the reality is it means zero. And mm -hmm. He's out um, there's still a lot yeah. of pressure that needs to be put on not just Russia, but these individuals to make things happen. Do you think, so it's one thing if there's a car shortage in the country, right? But obviously they're going to start being shortages of more and more goods and services in the country, there has to be a breaking point at some point, right? Yeah, I mean, the ruble is worthless. They yeah. have nothing coming in. I mean, it, there's a, they can't sell their products. There's a lot. Of, I mean, that's, that's a, I don't know. When you see the Swiss get involved and say, well, we're not going to handle transactions from Russia anymore, mm -hmm. yeah. that's a big deal. Yeah. I mean, they did business with the Nazis, okay? And for them to say no to Russia is historic on so many levels. And I agree with you. I think as more and more of this pressure builds up, and we're just covering it from an industrial perspective yeah. and a supply chain perspective, but as we know, that's where it all starts. Yeah. That's one of the reasons One of the reasons they went after Ukraine. It's for its an industrial infrastructure and mm -hmm. everything that it has there. And as this drags on and it starts to impact things at home, you'd think they can only last so long, but mm -hmm. Putin's also insane. So, uh, Is Red Notice... Nonfiction? It is. It's a true story. Okay. I know some more dramatic things happen in this book um, okay. that led him to to read it, but or to write it. But right now, it's just very interesting in terms of what he had to deal with in just from a business perspective. He tells a story about there's a there's an old Russian analogy where this guy finds a magical fish, and the fish says, "Hey, I'll give you anything you want, but whatever you get, your neighbor gets double." Mm -hmm. And the guy goes, "I want you to poke out one of my eyes." Oh. So that his neighbor has it twice as bad, right? So mm. this is sort of the mentality that some of these <laughs> businessmen have. Like, you're not going to get it, and neither am I. Or if I'm not going to get it, you're going to get it twice as bad. So Wow. All right. No eye pokes, you guys. <laughs> Follow okay. that. Yeah. So whatever, actually, whatever was stuck in your eye just jumped to mine. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before we move on to, in case you missed it this week, we have another word from our sponsor. Oil Eater's household cleaners, industrial cleaners, and industrial equipment are specifically designed to replace dangerous solvents and are used throughout the world. Our safe water-based formula dissolves grease and grime for almost any surface and leaves a fresh, non-chemical scent. Our ultra-concentrated formulas are perfect for light, medium, or heavy cleaning and can be used on shop floors, in parts washers, to clean equipment, and more. VOC compliant, Oil Eater will do an excellent job in a multitude of applications, safely and cost-effectively, while reducing your chemical usage. Safe for the user, safe for the surfaces being cleaned, and safe for the environment. For more information, visit oileater.com or call 800-528-0334. All right, and we're back. And before we get started with In Case You Missed It, we actually had a stat check. It turns out that the Ever Given was not what actually just recently ran aground in the Chesapeake Bay. The Ever Given was the one that got stuck in the Suez Canal. It was actually a sister vessel of the uh, Ever Given called the, what was it, the Ever Forward? Yeah. The Ever Forward. So still owned by Evergreen. Was that the company? Yeah. Um, so 
it's still uh, another problem with the company, but I yeah. uh, want to make sure that we get that right for everybody. Unless you've already emailed us about it, in <laughs> which case I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, in, in case you missed it, we like to talk about stories that maybe weren't as popular with the readers, but still stand to make a big impact on the industry going forward. Uh, Jeff, I wanted to start with you this week. What is your in case you missed it? Yeah, you know, we were talking about the NVIDIA hack earlier. We also talked about all these smart devices and some of the issues that they can create. Well, we ran a story talking about a new law that would require companies to disclose when they're hacked. And basically what it comes down to is a lot of these folks don't want to talk about it. What they would do is the reporting requirement would be legislation that would basically say, you need to tell us when something bad happens to you, especially if you're in some of the more key um, industries, I'm trying to find the exact um, stuff from the, uh, well, anyway, it's the key industries that, that need to be reporting this and talking to it. And one of the reasons that it's hung up a little bit is they want it to uh, be reported to the Department of Homeland Security, as well as the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. But this leaves out the FBI. So mm -hmm. the FBI says, hey, we want to be involved too. Right now, that's one of the main sticking points and sort of holding up the legislation from moving forward. But I think it's crucial when you're talking about banks, manufacturers, software providers, for them to be forced to report this data, not necessarily make it public, but at least tell these government agencies, mm -hmm. we got hacked. Um, and also, they want them to tell you if they paid ransomware. Mm. So we did get hacked. We couldn't figure out what to do. We paid the ransom and got our stuff back because the more we can develop some sort of portfolio on all of these nefarious individuals or organizations, the better equipped we can become to defending ourselves, both from a perspective of a bigger company as well as down to the individual level. And like with looking at the NVIDIA one, yeah, it was a hack on NVIDIA, but then all that malware stuff that was going on oh, afterwards, yeah. mm -hmm. it hit all their customers. Mm -hmm. And when it hits their customers, it hits the end user. So there is a trickle down effect there. And hopefully this type of approach, this legislation, which is backed by the White House, has bipartisan support. It's just stuck up over a sort of a law enforcement turf war right now. Yeah. Um, hopefully we can get this pushed through. As we see more and more stuff there, you know, we've talked about with things happening in Ukraine, they're concerned more about Russian cyber attacks here in the U.S. Stuff from China has always been an issue. We ran a, a story, I think a couple weeks ago, about how they actually, some Chinese agencies were able to hack state agencies and get yeah. a lot of personal information. So it's just an ongoing situation that, you know, we talked about before, you just throw your hands up and, and deal with it. Well, this is sort of trying to take a proactive approach to it and, and putting some more power into some of these agencies that can react. And it's, they're targeting, uh, and I think you were going to get into this, they're targeting three sectors that are critical to the nation's infrastructure. It is finance, transportation, and energy. Right. And it's, I mean, Anna, that seems like a no-brainer to me. It does. I mean, but it's a testament to like, I mean, you notice like how you accidentally find out about a hack because a public company had to pay ransom and they have to report that to their like shareholders or mm -hmm. um, it, to Jeff's point, like nobody wants to share it. They feel like that it's a knock on their company. It looks like a business risk mm -hmm. because they didn't get ahead of it. Um, but at the same time, it is very impactful. And if people continue to hide underneath um, the covers and, and not share that or disclose that these have happened, then it is really hard to collaborate on a solution. Mm. So I'm into it. I think it's a good idea. So we need another task force. <laughs> you know, it's like- uh, Can we, we be it? We have Space Force. I mean, no, I don't think we'll no? be recruited. No. Uh, I mean, we have Space Force now. We need like Cyber Force, US Cyber Force. I'm in. Yeah, we I actually agree. do need that. Uh, yeah, even that, a yeah. Parody. <laughs> Start as a joke. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. Not a joke. Oh, very good. Um, <clears throat> my In Case You Missed It This Week, is a story about cloud seeding and the fact that it might not be as promising as many hoped. So, it turns out that cloud seeding might not be all that it's cracked up to be. With cloud seeding, machines shoot chemicals into the sky and try to generate precipitation. The hope is that the method could help prevent droughts by producing rain or snow. But they need the right kind of clouds, at the right temperature, at the right wind con conditions. Essentially, it has to be a perfect storm. <laughs> The percentage increases in <clears throat> the percentage increases in tests were small, and it's hard to tell whether or not the snow or rain that fell in tests was natural or actually triggered by cloud seeding. Now, one of the best studies was in Australia in 2017, where seeding could have caused a 14% increase in precipitation. Now, that would be huge. That'd be a huge increase. But another study in the U.S. in 2020 
yielded about one tenth of a millimeter of snow. Not that promising. Not very much. And a six year study of cloud manipulation in Wyoming gained 1.5% accumulation. Maybe. Now, I just wanted to say that these studies can't always be winners. And when cloud seeding and the idea of cloud seeding first came out, I thought, what a novel, uh, what a novel approach to uh, sort of manipulate weather manipulation. But also, to seed the clouds, they need to blast them with like toxic heavy metals. And while they're not detectable when they come down in this limited precipitation, maybe this one's not the winner we were looking for. You know what the winner was? Hmm. We already shoot toxic chemicals into the sky and manipulate the weather. We've yeah. already done that and it was totally an accident. Yeah. Um, I, this stuff like freaks me out. I don't know. To me, it's like messing with nature is like sort of a scary proposition. Like I said, we've done that enough. Mm-hmm. By accident, inadvertently, why? Are, what, what if we? I don't know. This is like a bad movie. Like, what if we did it? It wrong is a bad movie. It's it called Geostorm. Just snows forever. Mm-hmm. With Gerard Butler. Um, <laughs> no, I completely agree with you. It's, uh, I, but I think you know, it's a typical, it's a typical human response to any problem. It's just like we, there's a way to fix it. Any any engineer sees any problem and says there's a there's a solution to it, and. While this was had initially promising results, maybe it clearly isn't working. And so maybe stop blasting canisters of gas into the sky in Colorado, Wyoming. Well, they've been been trying to do this for a while. Doesn't yeah, this it's like, like go back to the fifties. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. this has been going on. This has been attempted for quite a bit. And I agree. Um, even when they try to validate the improvement in precipitation in these areas, it's the weather, man. I mean, mm-hmm. how do you really know that it was that and it just didn't rain that day? I mean, it wasn't a little bit wetter. Yeah. So I I agree. I think it's actually encouraging to me to see them kind of maybe saying, yeah, we probably shouldn't be doing this kind of thing because yeah. it, seemed, it, it seemed like a long shot um, from the start. Well, and I'd like to cover a lot of the futurist R&D studies because I find them exciting. But when they come out and say, we missed, mm-hmm. you know, I like to shed a little light on that as well, because it shows that, you know, there's a lot of that uh, hubris in academia and people just think that, you know, they think they know better than everybody else. But, you know, this I mean, the author, I believe, was from Colorado State University and uh, it was a well-sourced article that just kind of said, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, because I think from an engineering perspective, it seems like a pretty simple premise, right? Yeah. It's a chemical reaction. So yeah. let's just replicate that. Mm-hmm. Well, Nature's not always that simple, I guess. Yeah, mm-hmm. just like stop it down there. Yeah. Where you you will get one tenth of a millimeter of snow. <laughs> Can you yeah. imagine like just standing there like, is that it? Oh no, I think that's it. Don't lick that snow. I think my you, just, God. you just go the other way. Do you see that? Yeah. yeah. Do you see that? I did that. We made that happen. We just played God. All right. From playing God to Anna's, in case you missed it. Uh, What do you got for us this week, Anna? All right. So National Pie Day was March 14th, as Mm -hmm. you all know. That's right. And it was an opportunity for people to geek about math and dessert on the same day. (laughs) Um, And also trying to explain Pie Day to my seven-year-old was hilarious (laughs) because she just walked away in the middle. (laughs) She was like, oh, this, uh, you could see her face like, oh, <coughs> this is boring. I wish I had. <laughs> oh, I, no. I have to go. We have dessert now. <laughs> so uh, as a way of highlighting the day, Brainly, which is an online homework community. I'm not sure what an online homework community is. Um, surveyed American students about their feelings towards math and also pie. Mm. So when asked about what their favorite subject was in school, 26% of students rated math number one, followed by science then English, then social studies or history. And I want to stop there and just say, if these results are in any way accurate, Mm -hmm. good on today's students, because I don't know, (laughs) maybe like this collective effort towards STEM is like working because I don't, this does not ring true to me really. I don't think FIAD was a choice. Mm. Yeah. But even like, if you asked me at any point, I would have been like, I don't know. It would have been fourth on that list for me. Yeah. Like, and you know, maybe kids are just smarter and better at math now maybe common core did that I, anyway math has been you know stem has sp- stem has made uh science and math class cooler uh bringing engineering into the classroom the use of 3d printing and other methods i mean uh i went and saw my niece this weekend and 
all of their Valentines were 3D printed in class. That's awesome. And that is just yeah, pretty cool. really cool. We had a cartoon character that was placed in a bag. Yep. And that was it. You know, I was just like, did you really 3D print these? And then she was talking talking to me about how the 3D printer works. I'm like, all right, this school district is working. Not sure about all the rest, but at least this one's working on it. Yeah. Well, and maybe the, maybe it's because like, yeah, that math is more like application oriented now and people can see like what the cool um, options are for that. Like I just yeah. remember being a lot of formulas and, you know, scratch work. But anyway, to the pie results. Um, <laughs> the important stuff. Forget the math. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so the number one favorite pie listed um, was chocolate, which is cheating. Yeah. Um, and then descending order, apple, lemon meringue, blueberry and cherry. And I just want to add that 18 percent of respondents said None <laughs> was their favorite pie flavor, which scored higher than blueberry, cherry, or lemon. What? So no pie was the third favorite pie. Um, such, a, such a kid response. Like, I can see all three yeah. of my kids, yeah. and I'd be like, oh, pie's lame. Yeah. I know. So oh math God. is in, pie is out. That, I, the more you know. This study is already garbage because pecan pie wasn't in the top five. Garbage. Um, I can go through there. Can either of you guys make it past uh, the uh, 3.14 no. in pie? No, I can't. But um, are, like, so in the survey, like, I think what seventy something percent of people said that they thought they could do the first five digits, and I was like, "Oh man, really? Mm -hmm. Re okay." Pi Day is my reminder of every, every year to check Twitter and see how far Neil deGrasse Tyson made it, <laughs> and he crushes it every year. Of course, he does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, <clears throat> well, let's move on to our final thoughts before we get out of here. Um, Anna, coming back at you, uh, what's your final thought this week? Uh, I just want to remind everyone that as masks are coming off and people are getting um, out and about that all the other stuff that we never got is is just in our faces now. Um, so I know like between David's kids, me, my kids, you personally, like this mm -hmm. week was like a week of um, disaster viruses that had nothing to do with COVID. Mm -hmm. So we can welcome those back with open arms. Yeah. It turns out you got to keep washing those hands. Yeah, the hands thing. That's just a, mm -hmm. that's a forever thing. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know what stomach flu was going around, but like, I mean, not to joke about it, but I was just like, I wish it was coronavirus <laughs> because I knew that it would have been more mild than that. It was, uh, it's getting brutal and uh, daycare is just ramping up, you know? It's starting to warm up. Everything's going to just cook in that uh, oh, God, school. Oh, God, stop. Mm -hmm. And just come firing at us. And it was... I hate that I like I pre I I predicted this. I was just like, man, we haven't seen humans in a while. We're gonna start passing things. It's gonna mm -hmm. get gnarly. I didn't think that I was gonna catch like the first six out of the bag. <laughs> I've uh, I have I have been more sick this past year than I have been the past ten combined. It was just like, am I really ill again? Like I just I need to drink more because then I just feel like I'm constantly hungover. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, no, my final thought this week was I just wanted to say, you know what? We turned one around. We turned one around last week. My anti thank you to non listener Heather turned her into a listener. Oh, and then she doubles down and actually gives us a positive review online. We got a couple positive reviews online. Uh, so I want to thank everybody that reached out with those and. You could really help us out a lot. Like that really does help the podcast and what we're trying to do here. Uh, it helps with our ranking and kind of searchability. So uh, be more like Heather and give us more positive <laughs> reviews. And also happy birthday, Heather. It was just, I mean, it was her birthday. She gave us a gift. It was nice. Wow. Yeah. Well said. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah. My final thoughts before I get to trivia is my mom made me a pumpkin cream pie. And that is the best. That's even better Ooh, than uh, that. Pecan. Does sound good. Yeah, yeah your good mom's stuff. The best she is. Speaking of trivia, mm. so last week we tried to talk. We talked about evaluating a casualty or somebody who's hurt and the five B's and putting them in order. Do you guys remember what they were? Or how do you want to remember what uh, what well, order was, you went in? I don't remember the order, but I know like blood's one of them. Bleeding is first. That's Ble the first one. Yeah, yeah. And maybe a break. Or excuse me, that's the second one. I'm sorry. Okay, bleeding, bleeding a burn. There's a break. Uh, brain, brain, because that's the one you can't tend to. What's the the fifth one? Burns. I said burn. I said burns. Well, here's the order. Oh, the actual order is first is breathing, obviously. Oh, I miss breathing. <laughs> Second is bleeding. <laughs> Third your, is broken bones. Your, your person is dead. Mm -hmm. 
Fourth is burns, and the last one is brain or head injuries. So yeah. you would go in that order. We only had one person get it right. Good job to Mark, a fellow uh, former resident of Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri. Good job to him. Nice. Everybody else. Nice. The one, the one that was thrown off was everybody thought that brain should be higher. Yeah. But the thinking is, if it's a head or brain injury, there's probably not a whole lot you can do. So get the other stuff taken care or of. Or like, first. how would you know as like a, just a regular person right. well, that? Yeah. So can you say, give a little more context around the methodology as to why it's in that order? Because that's the same. That's why I got it wrong. I thought, uh, you know, I thought if I see an accident victim, first thing I do is like you try to stabilize the head if it looks like whatever. Well, the, the thought is this and it does. It is coming from a combat environment. Yeah. So obviously, if they're not breathing, mm -hmm. you kind of yeah. want to move on. You no, know, that's probably, yeah. that's probably not much you can do there. Mm -hmm. um, at least not as a, if you're not a medical personnel, you know, if you're not a doctor or a nurse or somebody who's trained more thoroughly in medical care. So that's why you check breathing first. Bleeding is something you can stop. That's mm -hmm. obviously a big deal. If they are bleeding badly, you can take care of that. Broken bones, things like that. Obviously, if you can register it immobile, they might be able to move or help you assist them to do what they need to. Same thing with burns. The quicker you can treat that, which you should have something in your first aid pack to at least cover it or put something on to treat the burn. And again, you would handle those head and brain injuries last because it might not be so good. Right. Hmm. There's probably a okay. limited amount you can do. So you deal with the stuff you can actually address first mm -hmm. is the thought. Okay. So continuing to go from my soldier's, soldier's manual of common tasks from August of 2003. <laughs> here's one that actually could actually be pertinent in everyday life, whether it's in an industrial facility or out for a drink at the bar, you know, oh, no. um, going to a restaurant, whatever the case is. If you come across somebody who has an airway obstruction. Oh, okay. Okay. The first thought is you do the Heimlich, right? Mm -hmm. Which is done with the abdominal compressions from mm -hmm. behind. The other option is you can actually do chest compressions. Okay. Okay. There are three situations where you should definitely do a chest compression over an abdominal compression. Okay. If you can name two of those three reasons, you'll get one of those sweet Today in Manufacturing podcast t-shirts or... One of the new hats we have on the way. Ooh, I do not have a hat. No, we'll make sure that you get at least the fourth hat. No, um, <laughs> so this is when you would do a chest compression. So, like, in what situation? Somebody's somebody's choking. They can't okay. breathe. Like I said, probably commonly when you're at a restaurant or something yeah. like that. Person stands up. Normally, you would do the traditional Heimlich, where you kind of go like a thumbs width down on the abdominal, on the abdomen, and kind of push backward or pull backward. There are times when you should not do the abdominal thrust. You should do chest compressions. Oh. Are you, same same approach. You're behind. Oh, you're behind. And okay. you're doing, but you're going to go up here, okay. not down here. What did you say? Because everybody down? who's listening can see exactly what I just did. Yeah. yeah. You'd put the hands up on the chest as opposed to down on the abdomen. So when you said thumb, so would you do a thumb down from like the sternum and that's where you're supposed to go? Yeah. Oh, man. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, I took the class for the kid, but it just... Uh, I had a doll that was defective and I kept blasting the chest plate off of it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, so basically my certificate, my certificate is just in bad. <laughs> Learned a lot that day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, if you are going to get a hat, um, it turns out that you'll be sixth in line because we got to make sure that our producers, Alex and Eric get them as well. Um, all right, Jeff. I'm a little disappointed that we didn't have some sort of projectile today. Well, if you do the maneuver correctly, there will be a projectile. Oh! I just said it and he well knocked done. it down. Well knocked done. it down. All right. <clears throat> well, before we get out of here, please make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the podcast. You could also help us out a lot by leaving the podcast a positive review on whatever platform you use. Finally, to email the podcast, you can reach any of us at Jeff, David, or Anna at IN.com with email the podcast in the subject line. Also, if you want to subscribe to our daily or weekly newsletters, we'll make sure that you get the podcast in your inbox first. All right. For Jeff and Anna, I'm David Manti. This is the Today in Manufacturing podcast, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Today in Manufacturing podcast.